thank you, Lori. Uh, my name is Dan Marlowe. Um, and as Lori said, I'm uh, by, my day job is to uh, teach physics uh, at Princeton University. Uh, but as a sideline, um, I uh, help uh, the InfoAge uh, Space Exploration Center. Uh, and in particular, uh, with uh, the original job was to uh, restore uh, the TLM-18 uh, to operation. So let me see if I can advance my slides. Okay, so here's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'll talk about uh, the telescope itself, uh, some of its history, uh, and then go through its various capabilities. Uh, and, and just say a little bit uh, about each one. Missing from the list is EME, although I think I have a slide in there uh, showing how that, uh, showing some things about that. Okay, so uh, this is a uh, reasonably recent uh, photograph of the dish. Uh, you can see, uh, obviously, the dish itself. It's a 60 foot or 18 meter diameter dish. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we have uh, at the focus of the dish. Um, uh, to the right of the dish, you can see uh, the uh, control room. This is uh, the same building that was used for the Diana project. And um, it now uh, and, and subsequently served as the control room for the dish and is still the control room for the dish. It's also a small museum and uh, it's open. Uh, well, right now we're not open because of the pandemic, uh, but under normal times, it's open at least two afternoons a week, uh, Wednesday and Saturday, and also Sunday, Lori. Uh, yes, we're open yeah. on Wednesdays, one to five, Saturdays, one to five, and Sundays, one to five, unless yeah. we have a special event like this. Yeah, okay. So anyway, um, all right. So a little bit of the history of the dish. Um, this dish is a Cold War relic. It's located in Belmar, New Jersey or near Belmar, New Jersey. So that's just a few miles from the New Jersey shore. It's the former site of Camp Evans, which was part of Fort Monmouth, a US Army R&D site. Um, as uh, Lori talked about, this site was used for the first moon bounce experiment in 1946. Uh, that was a different antenna, which is uh, long gone. Uh, in 1960, uh, the TLM-18, this dish, received the first weather satellite images from space, and the satellite was the Tyros. Uh, some of you may uh, have some experience with the, uh, the NOAA satellites, the uh, polar orbiting satellites, and Tyros was a forerunner of those. Um, so the TLM-18 uh, was also used in in classified research until 1980 or so. After that, it uh, sat fallow for many years. And then uh, a small group of us uh, refurbished the dish in, uh, it took us roughly three years from 2012 to 2015. Okay, so this is the Tyros. Um, and I won't read that, uh, I think, uh, pretty much everybody now knows the importance of these weather satellites, um, especially when it comes to hurricane prediction, uh, the, uh, the saving of lives and property is enormous because of our ability to, to see the hurricanes coming. Okay, so uh, this is a photograph from 1960 when the uh, army uh, craned the 60-foot TLM dish into place at the Diana site. That's the same dish that was in the photograph I showed you earlier. Um, at the time, there were actually two dishes on site. Uh, the second dish is, is long gone. Um, I always like this photograph. This is uh, when Tyros was passing overhead. And uh, the thing that's uh, unusual, uh, would, would be unheard of today, is this character uh, sitting there smoking a cigarette. Um, and that, uh, of course, is uh, we're now a smoke-free facility. Okay, um, and again, this was a big deal. The image was uh, immediately transported uh, to the White House, and here's uh, President Eisenhower in the, in the late days of administration uh, admiring uh, the, the, the uh, image that was captured. Okay, 
So uh, I'll talk a little bit now about the work we did to uh, uh, get the dish back into working order. Uh, before I launch into that, let me just acknowledge uh, the, just some of the many people who uh, contributed to this. Uh, Fred Carl, who, who was then the director of InfoAge and is, is with us here today, uh, was really instrumental in getting this going. Um, I learned about it uh, through a colleague, Norm uh, Jurassic, uh, whose role I'll describe in a minute. And uh, uh, I, I won't go into the whole story, but I was interested in, in uh, getting access for our Princeton undergraduates to a, a more capable uh, antenna for radio astronomy. I learned about it. And at the time, uh, I, I Googled InfoAge and up popped Fred's phone number. He had his cell number uh, on the web. So I called him, he answered, and I said what I had in mind. And he said, well, sure, come on down. Uh, so my uh, wife and I uh, drove down to the site and uh, had a nice meeting with Fred and uh, we got started. Okay, uh, so other people, uh, uh, Martin Flynn, uh, W2RWJ, uh, who was a member of uh, a radio club called OMARC and also InfoAge. Uh, Martin did a, a lot to get things going, uh, IT and, and many things like that. Uh, Jeff Gettelfinger is an engineer from Princeton. He uh, uh, did a lot of the mechanical engineering involved in, in the refurbishment project. Uh, Norm Jurassic is a research scientist uh, at Princeton. He works in cosmic microwave background. He was uh, uh, the linchpin of uh, the very famous WMAP uh, cosmology program. And Norm just uh, basically knows everything. And uh, really uh, in, in terms of the dish controls and the, the, uh, the RF stuff, uh, Norm really uh, led the charge on that and it would not have been possible without him. Since then, uh, the dish has been handed over to InfoAge for operations. And this is where Lori, uh, today's uh, uh, master of ceremonies comes in. Uh, she is uh, the leader of a team of docents. So if you come to visit the dish, Lori or, or one of her colleagues who I've listed here uh, will, uh, will give you the tour. Okay. All right, uh, dish repair. All right. Uh, actually, there's a question. What does TLM stand for? It does stand for telemetry. Um, OK, TLM 18, it's the telemetry 18 meter dish. Um, I should mention, uh, since this has come up, there are many of these dishes uh, around the world, many of them still operating. Um, a, a series of them were built. Uh, they're perhaps most famously deployed uh, starting at Cape Canaveral and then on down through the Caribbean and into the South Atlantic. And they were used to capture telemetry uh, from the early rockets uh, as uh, NASA and its, its forerunners, the military developed uh, uh, mainly ICBMs, but also uh, the rockets that are used in uh, the current space programs or the earlier space programs. Okay. All right, so when we got to this thing, uh, it was actually in pretty good shape. Um, you know, this was done by the military and it was built pretty well. Uh, in particular, uh, we got a big old, uh, I think 50 volt DC power supply and hooked it up uh, to the motor that drives the azimuth. And uh, lo and behold, the thing turned. And that was very fortunate because if that part had not worked, uh, I think uh, we just wouldn't have been able to proceed. It would have just been too hard. There's a uh, 20 horse or 10 horsepower electric motor that sits up at the top of the pedestal inside. And it just would have been uh, too hard to uh, uh, get that out, I think. Uh, we were less fortunate on the elevation. Uh, so there's a motor that drives a ball screw that pushes on the arm that uh, allows us to change the elevation of the dish. And uh, that the motor itself was okay, but the ball screw mechanism uh, was very badly rusted. It had a rust cover that fell off, it weathered and fell off over the years. So that was a rusted hulk. Uh, what you see here is us uh, recovering that motor, the whole drive assembly, which consists of the motor and the ball screw. Uh, and lowering it to the ground. It literally weighs a ton. Um, the 
dish uh, prevented us from getting a crane in there, assuming we could afford a crane. So what we did instead is uh, Jeff Gettelfinger designed a small crane, a uh, hand crane that was, <coughs> excuse me, that was hoisted to the top of the dish piece by piece, assembled in place. And then that crane was used to lower uh, this uh, motor uh, drive assembly. Uh, and you can see we, we had a line, we pulled on it with a truck to keep it away from the pedestal. Uh, and then it was just lowered down. So that was sent out for refurbishment. Um, that itself was an adventure. Uh, we found a company on the web that looked like they could do this work. Um, and it, in fact, the, from its web page, it looked like it was this massive national uh, operation. You know, they had uh, facilities in Trenton and Chicago, North Carolina, Houston, all over the place. Turns out it was just a guy with a cell phone uh, who did know a little bit about it, but he was one step ahead of his creditors. And we sent him this thing along with, uh, I don't know, $10,000 or something. And uh, he made some progress. Uh, asked for more money. So we thought, well, what do we do? So we gave him more money. Uh, and then silence. Um, so somehow our purchasing uh, department was able to track the guy down. He had run out of money. He had basically disappeared. But somehow they managed to find the, the uh, motor, which had been mostly fixed, or the motor itself, but the ball screw, which had been mostly refurbished, uh, but not completely. And it was sitting in a warehouse, I think in Houston someplace, and the, this guy owed the warehouse people money. So we had to pay his bill and then finally we got it out of Hawk and uh, brought it back. And it was far enough along that our shop at Princeton uh, could finish the job. Uh, so then we had to repeat the process and uh, hoist it back up. Okay. Uh, and at that point, we still didn't know it would, would work because there was no way of knowing whether the bearing uh, that uh, supported the elevation uh, was in good shape, but um, it was a very exciting day when we uh, uh, turned the motor on and lo and behold, the thing moved. Okay, so a little bit about the readout. Um, uh, there are actually two such chains, one for each polarization. Uh, and what we have in the feed horn is relatively simple. It's a, a broadband low noise amplifier, uh, some bandpass filters. Uh, so that we do a lot of work at 21 centimeters. So we have a fixed filter there. And we also have a YIG filter uh, that can be tuned from one gigahertz to two gigahertz. And then after that, there's another amplifier to uh, boost the signals up further. There's about a 150 foot run of uh, coax uh, down to the control room. Uh, and there we have a digital receiver. It's, uh, if you're familiar with these things, it's uh, uh, an Edis uh, B210. Uh, and that basically digitizes the signals and uh, feeds them into a computer. We have a Linux box running GNU radio. Uh, before I get to that, let's back up and talk about the front end. Uh, so here, uh, this horn, uh, uh, the, at the focus is another uh, horn antenna. This is from an old experiment at Princeton, uh, which was designed to look at the uh, cosmic microwave background at 21 centimeters or to look at the 21 centimeter radiation. Um, and it's actually a, a pretty nice antenna. You can't see it, but inside here, it's all corrugated and everything. So it has a very nice pattern um, that gets fed up to um, a ch the amplifier chain that I showed you, you can see the uh, 21 centimeter filters, the YIG filters are in there. Uh, and then there are various uh, things that Norm designed in. Uh, okay, all right. And then in uh, at the other end of things, we use this uh, Edis uh, software defined radio receiver. Um, and uh, we, we mostly use GNU radio uh, and we combine that uh, or we run that on a Linux machine and we pointed the dish skyward or it was actually just pointing straight up, uh, turned it on and uh, there it is, uh, the 21 centimeter signal. So that doesn't look like much, but we were very excited to see it uh, since it, it showed that we were working. So basically you just see a big uh, 
lump of noise and then this relatively small 21 centimeter signal from the galaxy riding on top of it. Okay, so now let me just show you some of the dish's capabilities. Um, one of the simplest measurements one can do is a drift scan over the sun. So basically we uh, uh, point the dish south uh, and if we point it due south and at the angle corresponding to the expected elevation of the sun at noon, uh, then as the sun drifts through the beam of the telescope, or of course what's really going on is the earth is turning, so as the beam of the telescope drifts across the sun, you trace out the response of the dish. Um, the vertical scale here is uh, calibrated in uh, Kelvin, that's antenna temperature, you might think this should go to more like 6,000, uh, but the sun is actually hotter at 21 centimeters than a strict black body radiation curve would imply. So we typically more like uh, measure more like 10 or 12,000 Kelvin. Uh, what's important, what's most important is the shape of the curve. Uh, so you see, we get a pretty clean response. There's some side lobes, but they're, uh, they're not too bad. Uh, here, we, uh, plot the same data and now we've converted the time uh, to degrees. Uh, so you can see that uh, the width, uh, we, we fit this to an airy function uh, and uh, the width of that airy function is about one degree, 1.02 degrees, the fitted width. Uh, the expected width uh, from airy theory and uh, an 18 meter dish at 21 centimeters is more like uh, 0 0.9, uh, but we don't use the full dish. We, we under illuminate the dish. Uh, so it, it kind of make it, it, it's roughly consistent with what one would expect uh, for a dish of this size operating at 21 centimeters. Okay, so why 21 centimeters? Well, it turns out that the hydrogen atom, uh, which as you know, uh, consists of an electron and a proton, uh, has something called hyperfine splitting. And the hyperfine splitting comes about because you can think the proton and the electron are each tiny uh, magnets. And if you've ever played with bar magnets on a table, you know if you uh, push them together, uh, you can't really push them together such that they're aligned north to north, south to south. They want to flip over to lower their energy state. Well, the same thing is true in the hydrogen atom. Uh, the electron magnetic moment and the proton magnetic moment uh, from an energetic point of view prefer to be anti-aligned. However, hydrogen atoms can be found in either state. If you bang them hard enough, they'll, you can excite them. Uh, so they may find themselves in an aligned state, but sooner or later, uh, they'll want to flip over into this anti-aligned state, the lower energy state. When they flip from the high energy state to the low energy state, uh, a photon, which is a quantum of light, is emitted. And the wavelength of that photon, the wavelength of that radiation is 21 centimeters. So this 21 centimeter radiation uh, permeates uh, the galaxy. And that's because about 10% of the mass of the galaxy, our galaxy, the Milky Way, or really any galaxy so far as we know, will be hydrogen gas. So some of it will be in the excited state. It de-excites. Uh, and emits this 21 centimeter radiation. And that of course is a radio signal and you can uh, detect it. Okay, so the numbers here are kind of interesting. I said uh, an atom in an excited state will eventually de-excite. It turns out the mean time for that transition is 10 million years. It's a very weak, slow transition. Furthermore, uh, the, the density of hydrogen uh, in interstellar space is very low. It's about one atom per cc. Uh, I compare that to uh, say, just take your thumb, that's about a cc, and it will have about Avogadro's number of order 10 to the 24th uh, hydrogen atoms per cc. So really very, very weak signal, very low density of hydrogen, yet you see uh, a good signal. And that just tells you what a, an immense place the galaxy is. It's just by volume, it's just huge that you get enough hydrogen to, to lead to a detectable signal. All right. So not only do we see the signal, but it turns out 
uh, that there's a lot of information contained in it. We, uh, we can look at its Doppler shift in particular. So think of this signal as being kind of a cosmic whistle. The whole galaxy is out there whistling uh, with a frequency of 1420 megahertz. All right, so uh, the hams will know about, or at least hams who do uh, Earth, Moon, Earth or uh, satellite stuff will know about the Doppler effect. Basically, if you're looking at a, a cloud of hydrogen that's move, not moving with respect to Earth, then you'll see the signal pretty close to the expected frequency of 1420.4 megahertz. If, however, that cloud of gas is approaching you, you'll see it uh, Doppler shifted to a higher frequency, just as the siren from an approaching ambulance appears at a higher pitch. When that ambulance passes by, it shifts down to a lower pitch. Uh, uh, race cars do the same thing as they zip by, they go uh, Many, many examples of this. So approaching things give a high frequency, receding objects give a low, lower frequency. And in fact, what you can do is you can take the frequency information and translate that into a velocity. So not only do we uh, detect the presence of hydrogen clouds, we can tell their velocity with respect to us. Okay, so here is a fully processed 21 centimeter spectrum. I showed you that little nub on top of a big noise uh, signal. Here, what we do is we subtract off the noise or divide out the noise, and uh, we end up with a signal just from the hydrogen. This particular peak, this is really a, a spectrum Right, I could have calibrated this in megahertz, but instead uh, the scale is given, is converted to Doppler shift. Uh, so you can see that this particular cloud of gas has a, a Doppler velocity of minus 50 kilometers per second. So since this is approach velocity, that means that cloud of gas is uh, moving away from us uh, with a, a velocity of about 50 kilometers per second. Okay, so uh, another uh, simple measurement one can do is a 24 hour drift scan. And I show uh, what the hams call a waterfall display for this. So plotted on the horizontal axis is this uh, approach velocity, the, the Doppler velocity. Plotted on the vertical axis is time in hours. And you can see it runs from zero to uh, about 28 hours, it's slightly longer than a day. And in fact, uh, at the beginning of this plot, you see an island of uh, light up here. Uh, that same island of light appears uh, down at the bottom. It, we've just come around and we're looking at the, the same part of the sky 20, uh, 24 hours later. Uh, in the middle, uh, we see another island of light. The Milky Way is a band, from the point of view of an observer uh, on Earth, we're of course embedded in the Milky Way. So we see this as a band of stars uh, crossing the sky. And that band actually circles the whole Earth. So in one rotation of the Earth, you see it twice, or you, you see different parts of the band twice. If you've ever had the privilege of uh, being in a very dark night in a, uh, a place where there's a clear night, uh, little light pollution, you can see the Milky Way uh, fairly clearly and it appears as a band of stars across the sky. With 21 centimeters, you can see it uh, in, a, in a much, it's much easier to see at 21 centimeters. Okay, so um, what in some sense is more interesting to me than uh, these islands of light uh, that appear as we uh, uh, as the beam sweeps through the, the Milky Way is this little wisp of light uh, that is always there. And it turns out, okay, so that's 24 hours. So that makes sense. That's, or you can guess where that comes from the rotation of the earth. But a, a very interesting puzzle is you might think that the amplitude of that sine wave should be plus or minus 30 kilometers per second or no more than that, because that is the orbital speed of the earth around the sun. If you look more closely, you see it's actually plus or minus 50 kilometers per second. And uh, that has to do with the fact that the earth is moving not only because uh, of its orbit around the sun, but the sun itself is moving a little bit with respect to the, uh, to the galaxy. 
Okay, uh, so that's probably uh, enough detail on that for now. Okay, so uh, the other thing we can do, and this is kind of a long story, so I haven't, uh, I, I won't go through the details. I'd be happy to talk to anyone uh, if they're interested. In fact, the data for, to do this are available. If, if you'd like, uh, just contact me. Um, <clears throat> one thing that can be done and that we have done is we measure a galactic rotation curve. So basically, by looking at how fast the different parts of the galaxy are moving with respect to us, we can figure out what their velocity is with respect, uh, what, what the rotational velocity of the stars in the galaxy is uh, as a function of radius, uh, galactic radius. So uh, what we see here is uh, we, we managed to, uh, how do I put this? So one model we could use is the Kepler model. Uh, and, and that's this dashed line. That would be all of the mass concentrated at the center of the galaxy. Now that's of course unrealistic. Uh, we know the galaxy is an extended object, but you see it, it uh, completely different than the data we observe. The green curve is where we more realistically model the mass density in the galaxy. And that does much better, but it still uh, does not adequately describe the data. Uh, the curve that is fitting the data really uh, reasonably well is an isothermal sphere model, and this includes dark matter. So even with this relatively simple device, we're able to, uh, I would call this, develop circumstantial evidence for the existence of dark matter. Okay. All right, so uh, the other thing we can do, and this was our original motivation, is to see pulsars. So pulsars are uh, rotating neutron stars that emit uh, signals, They're, uh, they really emit them continuously in time, but there's a lighthouse effect. Uh, and that light, lighthouse effect uh, causes the signal to blink on and off uh, as time goes on. All right, um, so well, what is a pulsar? So if a star, uh, collapses, and if a star starts with something like uh, eight times, between eight and 16 times the mass of the sun, when that collapses, it doesn't uh, collapse down to a black hole or to some other object. It collapses, it is a supernova explosion, and uh, the remnant that's left is a neutron star. Uh, the amount of mass that's left is about 1.4 solar masses. Um, this is nuclear matter, so all the atoms have collapsed, so you're just down to, uh, well, it, not protons and neutrons because the protons combine with electrons, so you're just down to uh, neutrons. This nuclear matter is extremely dense. One teaspoon uh, worth weighs about three billion tons. Uh, so you take something that has the mass of the sun, you collapse it down to something with roughly the size of Manhattan, and then it, it, it spins end over end once a second. It's really a, uh, an impressive object. Okay, so it, through various complicated means, radiates a broadband energy, there's actually a signal. Uh, most of the signal is at the longer wavelengths. In fact, the original discovery was made at 80 megahertz, um, but uh, we're working at a much higher frequency, 1421 megahertz. Compensating for that is the fact that with the shorter wavelengths, you can get more antenna gain. So it's more or less a wash uh, and we see a decent signal at, uh, at 1420 megahertz. Okay. Um, all right, so there it is. There's our booming signal. Uh, this is a thousand turns, so uh, uh, roughly a thousand seconds. Uh, the signal is not exactly booming. <clears throat> it sits on top of a huge noise pedestal. So there it is there. It, it just happens to come in around uh, point 0.2 in this phase plot. Um, however, if we subtract away the noise, then we see uh, a pretty decent signal here. Um, it, we typically get signal to noise ratios of uh, 20 or more uh, for the brighter pulsars. Okay, so uh, finally, uh, I'll talk a little bit about moon bounce, uh, which is the topic uh, of today. So uh, 
not too long after we got things going, we added transmit capability on 23 uh, centimeters, the 1296 megahertz band. In particular, uh, we have a 250 watt uh, 1296 uh, megahertz amplifier uh, sitting up in the feed uh, line. We can switch that in and out with a relay. Um, so when we go over to transmit, the relay flips over and instead of uh, receiving signals, we drive a transmitted signal into the antenna. Uh, this, this is uh, pretty busy, just shows the, the block diagram of how we do this. Um, the receiver is a Kenwood T, or the transceiver, I should say, is a Kenwood uh, TS2000X, a uh, fairly well-known ham transceiver. Okay, so um, we'll see. I'm always a little nervous when we demonstrate this publicly because as anyone who's done this sort of thing knows, if something is not gonna work, uh, it's not gonna work when you have a lot of people there. But anyway, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, when things are working properly, which they usually do, uh, CW is very easy to copy uh, and a single sideband is uh, quite intelligible. Uh, in particular, um, I remember one of our first contacts was with uh, someone, I, I forget who, exactly who it was, but it was someone abroad and I could tell uh, that they're, they, you know, they had an accent that was not uh, consistent with that of a, uh, a native speaker of English. Uh, the audio was clear enough for that. Okay, and um, this turns out to be a very popular demonstration for the public. I think a lot of the radio astronomy is, uh, tends to be a bit detailed, but uh, everybody uh, likes the idea of uh, having their voice bounce off, off, the, uh, off the moon. All right, so that is uh, all I have to say. I'd be happy to uh, answer questions in the time available. Um, thank you for your attention. Um, please do consider donating to InfoAge. Um, InfoAge and the ISEC, it's an all volunteer operation, but it nonetheless takes a fair amount of money to keep it going. Uh, we need to pay the power bills, uh, heating and air conditioning. Uh, maintenance. Uh, there's just lots of expenses uh, associated with running uh, a museum like uh, InfoAge and, and the, uh, the dish is part of that. Uh, as you can imagine, the past year has been especially difficult because of the, uh, because of the uh, pandemic. So uh, there's a link to the donate page can be found in the Zoom chat. If you just Google or go to InfoAge.org, uh, there's a contribute link up top and it will take you there. It asks you to fill in your address, but you don't actually have to do that. If you have a PayPal account, you can just go right there. So um, every little bit helps. It asks you to give $25. If you can do that, that's great. But uh, $5 is also uh, uh, helpful um, yeah, because uh, there's tremendous enthusiasm among the volunteers here and uh, we just need literally need to keep the lights on. Okay, <clears throat> all right, so uh, be happy to take questions now. You can either put them in the chat window or uh, I think you can just unmute yourself and uh, call them out. Uh, N9NL has asked about the block diagram. Yeah, there are two separate antenna probes. Those are for the polarizations. Um, we, for moon bounce, we just use a single polarization. Um, at least on transmit. We can receive on both polarizations, but we can only uh, transmit on one. We've really, uh, to be honest, we've really not spent uh, time optimizing that. Other questions? Okay, so uh, let me uh, turn this back over to Lori then. And uh, I will stop my share. So let me just say that Dan's explanation of what we do with the TLM-18 today was, is, is and was excellent. We use the TLM-18 today to do the moon bounce. And I am a licensed cam radio operator, KD2 OMA, and do the moon bounce regularly as visitors come to see our museum. And yes, it's, it's kind of fun. And uh, people love to bounce their voice off the moon. And my experience has been that they generally 
uh, think about it for a moment and then decide what it is that they want to say. And, and usually it's something very simple like, hello moon. And then they realize that they have this tremendous opportunity to send their voice out basically into the universe because as waves propagate, they hit the entire surface of the moon and they overshoot the moon. So someone with the right ears that can, that can decode the particular frequency of a person's voice hears you. <laughs> and then they begin to think about what else they actually want to say. And uh, it becomes very interesting. It's a lot of fun, but, uh, but it's also a serious thing. We can see a lot of our own galaxy and beyond. The farthest object that we look at is M31, which is the Andromeda galaxy at the edge of the Andromeda galaxy and is 2.5 million light years away. And as I say to visitors who come uh, to visit, who are maybe not as technically um, savvy as the people who are here today, I always say that this is something that is accessible to everyone. And that is the mission of InfoAge to make science and history accessible to everyone. And I think that, uh, you know, we do the best that we can with that. And sometimes it will uh, invite a child to learn more who may be the scientists of the future to discover exactly what dark matter really is. So that is our mission, that is what we do. So please consider donating. I think it's a good mission and uh, you never know. You never know whether it's your grandkid who will be the one to discover what dark matter is and unlock secrets of the universe that we could never have even imagined. So uh, with- <laughs> Laurie, if I, if I could just comment, uh, something you said reminded me of something. I think I read it on a ham reflector someplace, but it, it's something uh, I've always found amusing to ponder. And that is, uh, and I made this comment about just how enormous the galaxy is. And uh, people have been sending radio signals for oh, a little over, a, let's, let's call it 150 years, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally. And um, turns out the galaxy, or it, it is a fact that the galaxy is 100,000 light years across, um, but it's very thin in the other direction. It's really a pancake or even a, a, a plate-like object that's 1,000 light years thick. The Earth happens. The, the Earth and the Sun happen to sit more or less right in the middle of that, in the thin direction. So, from us to the thin edge of the galaxy, more or less the shortest path to the edge of the galaxy is 500 light years. So, a signal that was transmitted back in the dawn of radio has made it one third of the way to the thin side of the galaxy. So, it just you know moving at the speed of light all that time. So, you know, the, the sizes involved are just enormous. And, and just to follow up a bit more on what Lori has said, we do the EME. Now, of course, that's not always available because the moon is not always uh, above the horizon. But pretty much everything I talked about today, uh, we demonstrate. Um, since the original setup, we've uh, put in a much more capable uh, pulsar receiver. We now, uh, it's a wideband receiver. We use GPUs to process. Uh, we take about 250 megahertz of bandwidth. Uh, we calculate the fast Fourier transforms using a, a GPU board. And uh, long story short, we can see pulsars very, very quickly now. We get a, especially with the brightest pulsars, we get a signal quite, quite quickly. Okay. I'll, I'll How many have you discovered, Dan? Uh, we haven't discovered any uh, because, you know, Arecibo and uh, competitors are, are far more capable, but we have observed, uh, I don't know what the number is, it's probably about 20 or so. Uh, we, we, we see quite a few. And uh, one of the things we've been able to do with the new wideband system is see the dispersion curve, uh, which allows us to uh, that's how astronomers estimate the distance uh, to pulsars by seeing how much the signal is dispersed as it uh, travels through interstellar space. Uh, and also there's another uh, very interesting effect uh, called scintillation, uh, where you can look at a pulsar one day or one time and you'll see this booming signal, really, you know, it's a very strong signal. And then you 
do everything under basically the same conditions the next day and you can barely fish the signal out of the noise. And this is analogous to the twinkling of stars. Uh, stars twinkle because of uh, constructive and destructive interference as the light passes through the atmosphere. Pulsars twinkle uh, because of destructive and constructive interference as the light, as the radio signal propagates through interstellar space. The time scales are quite different. Uh, twinkling, of course, is you know a, a second or a fraction of a second. Uh, pulsar twinkling, scintillation, the time scale is sort of 15, 20 minutes. And it also varies with frequency. So you can, again, you can see a, si a very strong signal at 1450 megahertz and then just nothing at 1400 megahertz or vice versa.